Hello and welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, which is entitled Digital Developments and Precision Medicine in Pediatric Growth Disorder Management. My name is Martin Savage, and I'd like to introduce you to the faculty. I'm based uh, here in London at Barts in the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. Professor Leo Dunkel, uh, also at Barts in the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. Uh, Dr. Luis Luque is co-founder of digital therapeutics company Adhera in the USA, and he is uh, speaking from Spain. And Professor Sandro Locke is head of pediatric endocrinology at the Pediatric Hospital in Cagliari in Italy. These are the learning objectives which set out what we hope the learners will be able to take away from the webinar, essentially to explain current practice gaps in the management of short stature, gain knowledge in digital programming, gain awareness of and confidence in the use of digital technology, and finally to debate what can be learned from the use of digital tools in other endocrine disorders. And here is the agenda, which will become clear as we go through the webinar. We have applied for accreditation by the European Accreditation Council. And uh, if you would like to claim a credit for joining this webinar, please complete your evaluation form. Now, throughout the webinar, you can interact by answering the polling questions and by sending us your questions at any time using the box on your viewing screen. Please complete the evaluation form at the end of the webinar, and you must complete the evaluation form, as I said, if you wish to claim credits for this activity. This program has been made possible thanks to an independent educational grant from Merck Healthcare, KGAA, Darmstadt, Germany. Some pre-assessment questions. In order to measure learning, the following questions will be asked now and at the end of the webinar to test your knowledge. The correct answers will be revealed at the end of the webinar, if relevant. So here is the first question. Which of the following is false related to automated growth monitoring? A increases the number of growth-related referrals, B, decreases referral of normal children, C, improves diagnostic yield of growth disorders, and D, delays diagnosis of growth disorders. Please answer this question. The next question is, I have confidence in the use of digital technology to improve management of growth disorders, as well as patient self-management. I strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. So please consider these options. And the third question, which of the following factors is likely to decrease adherence to growth hormone therapy. Administration of oral growth hormone, presence of social difficulties and comorbidities, prepubertal stage, or new starter on growth hormone therapy. So I put together one slide of current practice gaps in the management of short stature. Here are my disclosures. And here is the slide which outlines the current practice gaps in the management of short stature. Early identification and referral of abnormal height and growth is extremely important. 
early correct diagnosis of true pathological short stature, early initiation of appropriate licensed therapy, accurate assessment of efficacy of therapy, notably with human growth hormone, high quality adherence to human growth hormone treatment regimens, and patient support and enhancement of the patient or family to healthcare professional relationship. So we will be addressing some of these practice gaps during the webinar. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Leo Dunkel, who will give the first presentation entitled Digital Interpretation of Height Measurements to Facilitate Early Diagnosis. Leo. Okay, thank you, Martin, for the introduction, and uh, also thanks for inviting me to this webinar. My title uh, is Digital Interpretation of Height Measurements to Facilitate Early Diagnosis. Uh, these are, are my disclosures. And I, I start with this very basic question, why do we measure height and weight? Uh, there's a lot of empirical evidence that growth is well established as an indicator of general health and well-being in children. And therefore, we think that monitoring height and weight is useful in identifying disorders affecting growth. And usually we uh, justify this exercise with early diagnosis of short stature disorders, most commonly growth hormone deficiency and Turner syndrome. Uh, screening for tall stature is uh, a bit more con controversial. There are some countries who do it, and I'm also touching this issue at the end of this talk very briefly. What do I mean with uh, early diagnosis? These are a couple of examples from my own clinical patient files. So here we have a girl with Turner syndrome who was diagnosed here at the age of five. Uh, but when we analyze her growth data in retrospect, these open diamonds, they are abnormal height measurements. Uh, what I mean by abnormal, I'm also getting back to this a bit later. And as you see, she could have been identified already around the age of one year based on these height measurements. A uh, couple of other examples here is we have a boy with tall stature and he's having Marfan syndrome. His uh, uh, diagnosis was quite delayed despite the fact that he was very tall during all his childhood. And, and this was perhaps complicated by the fact that his target height was quite high. So he had tall parents. But then, in retrospect, he had abnormal height measurements practically from birth. And here we have another example, a girl with growth hormone deficiency. And she was diagnosed here at the age of 12, which is, as you all know, it, it's very late age for diagnosis. And it's relatively desperate when we are very close to onset of puberty to increase adult height with any growth promoting therapies. And this girl could have been identified already at the age of four. So in this way, we are able to, at least in theory, facilitate early diagnosis with analysis of, of growth oxological data. But then uh, I, I mentioned that uh, this is Growth monitoring is very much based on empirical evidence, uh, and there are very many unanswered questions related to growth monitoring, like what is the best monitoring strategy? Should we analyze longitudinal height measurements, or is it enough we just make one off or single measurement? At what age, if we do fewer height measurements, at what age is the optimal age for this, and so forth? And then, perhaps most importantly, how do, we, how do we define normal growth? It's not as easy as my, my, you might think. 
And, and, and I said uh, that, that there are very few studies, but there are some. I have listed a couple of studies here which touch the issue of, of growth monitoring in a population. Uh, when we uh, screen anything in the population, we usually try to make distinction between normal population and a target condition. So with uh, a certain trait, they are different. And, and we start making this distinction by defining specificity. So specificity it means that what is the percentage of, of the normal population to be above a certain cutoff point. So here, for instance, specificity of 99% means that of the normal population, we identify 1%. And this cutoff then automatically in the target population, it defines sensitivity. So this cut, the same cutoff then identifies 70% of the target condition, as you see here. And, and we can also play with this uh, issue of specificity. So here we are a bit more relaxed. So here we have specificity of 95%. So we have 5% of the normal population to be identified with this cutoff. And of course, autom automatically, we are increasing sensitivity up to 88%, as you see here. And um, statistically, how we describe or, or characterize the, the interrelationship between specificity and sensitivity, we use these kind of plots, what we call ROC plots, R-O-C, ROC plots. And here we have uh, three different screening parameters, height SDS, target height SDS, change in height SDS over time, so height SDS deflection, and we can also combine. And, and uh, how good our screening method is, is really described or characterized by this curve. So if we have a, a method which is as good as guessing, so if we toss a coin, then we get this type of line. And if we have a, a screening which is performing better than guessing, then this curve is shifted to the upper right, uh, sorry, upper left corner. And as you see that, when we screen girls with Turner syndrome, height SDS is relatively good. Target height SDS, so we take parental height into consideration, it's even better. Change in height SDS uh, over time, not as good. But when we combine these three screening rules, we get almost perfect separation between normal population and uh, girls with Turner syndrome. This is another way to look at this. So this is the, com for instance, we here we can look at the combined uh, rule combining height SDS, target height SDS, and, and change in height SDS over time. So if we have specificity of 97%, girls with uh, 45XO karyotype, we can identify practically everyone by the age of eight years. And also if we include other karyotypes, of course, because many other karyotypes, they have a milder growth phenotype, then we can still identify relatively good percentage of girls with Turner syndrome, as you see here, by combining these three screening rules. But this all sounds relatively theoretical. And, and how do we do this in practice? And, and I will show one example, which is the Finnish example. So in this photograph, you see this is old photograph taken more than a century ago. Uh, this is from a child welfare clinic or well baby clinic. And, and growth monitoring has very long traditions in Finland. So in fact, in Finland, they take this very seriously. So growth monitoring is regulated by law. Uh, and they have as many as 25 health monitoring visits during the growth period, including height and weight measurements. There are primary care nurses trained in oxology. There's very good population-based growth reference, which is important really to, to define no normality. And what has also been very useful in this in the Finnish setting is that they have had electronic health records in primary care for more than three decades in, in operation. Uh, 
So how do they do this in Finland? They use these three screening methods or, or, or parameters, what I just said, distance of height SDS from the average height. In. So here we use the population reference distance high of height SDS from target height. So here we use the parental height, so genetic height potential, and then change of height SDS over time, which is the same as, as growth rate or height velocity. So change, it's just another way to express height velocity. And each of these rules has a specificity of 99%. So it means that roughly 1% of normal population is identified by these rules. So just to show this in practice here, we have in the y-axis, we have height SDS. And here we have individual height measurements of a girl. And these are the screening li limits. So in, in Finland, they also screen for tall stature disorders. And the, the screening uh, cutoff point is, is the lower cutoff point is 0.35th centile. So if we look, for instance, this girl here, uh, we see that she is having abnormal height measurement by this definition around the age of 8.5. So then we take target height into consideration. And, and you see that this is getting narrower. And this works much better. In this girl, we see that she has abnormal height measurement here already at the age of 1.5. So and practically almost all height measurements are, by this, this definition, they are abnormal. And then the change of height SDS over time, this is by far the most complicated one to do in practice, because over a certain period of time, there are defined normal limits, like here at the age of nine. During the preceding three years, normal change in height SDS over time is 0 0.9 SD. She has had decrease in height SDS of 0 0.8 SD, so by this screening, rule this is normal uh, deflection it's not really flagging yet and how do they do this in practice height measurements are taken in normal way like here and then they are entered in into electronic uh, health records and then they are printed and analyzed by, by uh, oxology nurses but then how does this work in practice uh, it sounds a bit complicated and actually, I, I have uh, to analyze this type of data uh, in, in very busy clinics. And this was the situation 20 years ago when I started personally getting interested in this issue. I noticed that it doesn't really work practically at all in the way it was intended to work in, in the Finnish system. So uh, I was working as a consultant um, uh, in a university a hospital. And we noticed that more than half of our referrals came in, in, in the Finnish system came from uh, secondary, uh, came uh, from totally normally growing children. So this meant unnecessary examinations, but then also occasionally we saw cases like I reviewed before that there are abnormal screening results and, and, and they were missed and, and this really caused delayed in referrals and delayed in, in diagnosis as well, of course. So we thought uh, that we automate this. Uh, and, 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 and the basic idea behind is, uh, was this, of course, that it, what, what was being done in the primary care, it didn't work. And then they already had these electronic health records in place. And we thought that computers are very much better with crunching numbers and people. And we think that let's analyze this in, in computerized way and automate this, make automated flagging of anything what is abnormal, defined by computers, and then refer only these cases to specialist care. Uh, and, and we did the first study in, in one municipality, which is a relatively large municipality close to Helsinki uh, in a city called Espoo. Uh, 241,000 uh, inhabitants, very functional primary care. And in this municipality, they had 150 pediatric primary care nurses and they had 
electronic health records in place for quite a while already. So everything was on computers. And, and how it works, it works actually totally in the background. So, so the primary care nurses, they don't know when they impute uh, height measurements, they are transferred to a server, which then analyzes. And if there's anything abnormal, it is flagging these abnormal height measurements and, and is forwarding these to a, uh, a consultant who is pediatric endocrinologist. And this one then provides advice to primary care what would be the sort of optimal way to proceed from here. So we did one year uh, trial first, which was the pilot, and I call this automated monitoring uh, period. So we did this uh, one year trial. Uh, uh, so I, I call this automated intervention year. And then we used the previous year as a as a control, so this was the control year. So uh, in this design, I, I really want to emphasize this, that the automated uh, growth monitoring was something what was done on top of or already functioning growth monitoring, which was manual type of work. And here we just implemented the uh, computer-based analysis and, and then consultation process, which is based on abnormal height measurements. So relatively uh, good numbers of children, uh, similar numbers during these two years. Of the whole child population, we screen 88% on both years. And then we, uh, we analy analyze referral, what number of referrals for abnormal growth to secondary care, what was the diagnostic yield of growth disorders, and cost effectiveness. And I'm going to speak a bit about these two first, not really touching the issue of cost effectiveness of this uh, process. So first we noticed that automated monitoring, it increased the number of growth re related referrals. So in the control year, um, there was one child out of 481 being referred, so altogether 68. 0.21%, and this was increased up to one child out of 155, so 209. So roughly three times more growth related re referrals to, to primary, uh, from primary care to, to secondary pediatric care. But then uh, when we look at uh, what was the outcome, how much we improve the diagnostic yield. So we analyzed all the referrals and what was ultimately found out of these. So in the control year, only eight of these uh, 68 children got a specific diagnosis. And this was increased up to 48, uh, which was quite significant because it was a six-fold increase in, in the diagnostic yield from control year to this automated intervention here. Uh, so at this point, I would like to ask you a question. If you think when we do growth monitoring, what are the diagnoses we aim at, at finding in the population? Is it Turner syndrome, GHD, celiac disease, inborn errors of metabolism, chronic kidney disease, bone dysplasia? So you can tick as many as you think are appropriate. So this list actually also gives an answer to the previous question. What are we screening when we screen for uh, uh, short stature? So we see various diagnoses. So actually all the points I listed in, in the previous question are correct. So we are simultaneously screening for multiple different disorders. We also analyzed whether we could have identified these earlier. So now again, I'm, com I'm comparing the existing growth monitoring to this automated monitoring. And, and we, in retrospect, we analyzed what was the delay of diagnosis. So how much earlier we could have identified this. So the average delay was almost two years. And in some cases, as you see here, there was very significant delay, which I think could have also really 
affected the outcome, the final outcome of, of the disease if, if this had been diagnosed earlier. So just these couple of examples, they actually came from this, this uh, pilot study, what we did here. Here was the Turner girl who was identified here, could have been identified much earlier. This Ma Fun boy could have been identified much, much earlier. And this GHD here also identified through this automated growth monitoring. So just to conclude, this type of automated growth monitoring, it, it of course, it increases the number of growth related referrals. Uh, I didn't show this, but it decreases referral of normal children, because previously we had a very high percentage of normal children to be referred. And it massively improves the diagnostic yield of growth disorders. And in this way, it, it also facilitates earlier diagnosis of growth disorders. So basically it works better than standard growth monitoring in primary care, which was very relatively intensive. So we could also think that we could uh, discuss what, what to be identified. So should we discuss these target disorders? In my opinion, tall stature disorders should be included because there is quite a lot of pathology among children who are growing a bit excessive rate or are very tall. Also this standard growth monitoring, I think what we showed in this study that it is very ineffective. Uh, and of course, if we do something, we should try to do it as well as possible. Uh, if we do this type of automated growth monitoring, it's all, of course extra investment. But if, if we analyze this, uh, it's this incremental cost of this system is only about two three percent and if we in make a sort of incremental investment of a couple of percent and we increase the efficacy by six fold i think it is really worth and the health policy makers have been convinced about this as well so this type of automated growth monitoring is is now in clinical service production in the whole country in finland and, and we are currently analyzing how it is working Unfortunately, I don't have these data quite yet to be shown, but, but it's equally, I, I can only say that it looks equally convincing also in the large scale production in the whole country. So uh, I thank a couple of people who have been working with me, especially these two names, Ulla Sangilampi and Antti Saari. If you read this literature, you will find their names in, in very many publications in this area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Leo, for a very clear and informative presentation. It now gives me pleasure to introduce Luis Luque, and the title of his presentation is Application of Digital Resources to Growth Disorder Management. Luis. Thank you, Martin, for your very kind presentation. As Martin has mentioned, I'm going to speak to you about how to use digital resources in the context of growth disorder management. A little bit of information about my conflict of interest. Let's just start from the very beginning. So what, what it is digital health? Uh, if we go to the definition of the World Health Organization, e-health, means the use of information communication technology for health. What does it mean? That means the use of clinical information systems, like looking into x-ray in your electronic health record, also the use of mobile and connected devices, like, for example, 15 years ago, I was developing mobile applications for diabetes. Nowadays, we also have smart watches that they are also have computing capacity and sensing. And very important in pediatrics, we have connected devices that allow you to track uh, adherence and also continuous glucose monitoring. But what is very important to know is that nowadays, the mobile phones, they have actually a lot of power and you have applications that rely on the use of camera, sensor and computing power of the phone. Uh, when we are speaking about e-health, it's not only connected devices, but it's also the use of internet. 
Nowadays, there are millions of videos for diabetes education, health education, and many of those are actually made by patients that they upload the videos themselves into YouTube. You also have personal health records where people can make appointments. So we have a very wide range of ecosystem of technologies. But we need to remember what is key. In a document from the World Health Organization, they emphasize that in order to enable digital health, we need to consider the context, uh, meaning things like leadership and governance. We need to have a strategy and very important, digital health cannot really work without the workforce. So the training of healthcare professional like you is key for enabling the use of this technology in the clinical practice. Let's try to be more concrete now, and we are going to review how digital health can be used across the patient journey. We need to consider the different stakeholders that are crucial. Uh, in one hand, we have the healthcare team that needs to be supported in the, the clinical decision-making. And for that, you have many different tools for supporting monitoring, getting to know more the lifestyle and the patient report outcomes, and also some predictive models. But actually where digitalization is happening very fast right now, it is in the patient side at the homes. What happened in between the clinical visits where patients and caregivers, they have access to patient support tools, a tool for monitoring adherence, and many different technologies to support patient engagement. And I will give you a few examples now. Let's start with the clinical uh, team. Nowadays, uh, there, is, there are a lot of technology related to artificial intelligence that can take images and actually annotate and analyze them to make easier for radiologists or, or pediatric endocrinologists to analyze the content and interpret the, the result. For example, uh, the tool Bone Expert allows you to calculate the bone age of children or actually some rare conditions. And they are publishing quite a lot of uh, research results like uh, last year in ESPE, they have one publication. And another uh, example is the use of mobile technology to capture data and analyze data from rare conditions, genetic disorders. In the project phase two gene, they have developed a mobile application that actually takes a picture of the child and then analyze the different features of the children to try to make a mapping between the phenotyping and potential genetic disorders. Uh, I strongly recommend you to watch that video on the, on the right that explain how the artificial intelligence is automatically learning all those facial features that will help them to detect the potential genetic disorders. Of course, those tools are not meant to do the diagnose, but to just help the clinician to identify potential diagnosis. One last example about tools to support clinicians in the context of growth hormone treatment is how to support the tracking of adherence to treatment. This is very important because it's the, the key uh, behavior that the patients need to achieve to actually have good clinical outcomes. For that, nowadays we have connected devices where you can get information about the dosage, when the, the children or the parents are taking the injections, but all of the information is sent securely over the internet to a dashboard where the clinicians can learn more about the different patterns of the patient in terms of taking injections, whether they do it during the night, do they do it during the morning, maybe there are some issues during the weekend, and that can be synchronized real time facilitating understanding any potential issue related to adherence. And all that data can be actually also used for adherence research. And uh, Professor Sandro Locke will explain to you a little bit more about that from a, a study with many patients from Italy. Now let's move a, a little bit to the patient side. Uh, one thing that we need to realize that patients and caregivers, they use a lot of mobile phones 
And actually, most likely, many of them have mobile apps installed. So we were wondering uh, what what is out there in terms of apps to facilitate to track growth meant to be used by by parents. So we went to the Google Play, and when you look for a application for growth, you find huge amount of them. We didn't know anything about uh, their content, so we decided to do a systematic uh, review of those apps. Uh, we identified more than 70 apps in Android. Many of them, they were related to growth tracking. There were also some of them for a uh, professional, like calculators of uh, different parameters. And some of them, they were related to education and education for growth hormone. One thing we need to know is that those apps, they were very popular. In total, they have more than 3 million downloads. And there were some issues that actually may be a little bit scary. More than 20% of those apps, they were collecting precise location of the user, like GPS data, most likely for running advertisement and getting more money from their ads. And also we found apps that they were of very bad quality. Some of them even promoting natural growth enhancers or even exercises like promising like 10 centimeters growth if you do some stretching exercises. Now let's go to see what is in terms of evidence out there. We know that in uh, juvenile diabetes many years ago, they were already making uh, solutions to support patient education. How they did it? Combining technology related to games with education, because in children we know that game-based technology can be very efficient. So what they did, they created a video game for the Nintendo that in order to progress in the game, to cover all the different missions, uh, to get points, the user, the children with type 1 diabetes, had to learn about glycemic control, about food, nutrition. They did a randomized control trial and actually they managed to prove uh, better outcomes in terms of self-efficacy, communication issues, and also a decrease in uh, urgent doctor visits. It's not only that technology can help in the early stage of the diseases. There are also studies showing that technology like web and SMS can be used to facilitate the transition to adult care. In this project in the US, what they did was to create a special content to promote communication of the patients with the adult care team and also to promote self-efficacy and uh, self-management behaviors. They did the randomized control trial and they managed to have actually positive outcomes in several chronic conditions in terms of uh, disease management skills, self-efficacy, and also communication with clinicians. One thing we need to know about technology is that new techniques are emerging all the time because many devices are also coming to the market, they are becoming more powerful and they allow to do things that maybe five years ago was not possible because the technology was not ready. Uh, one very good example is augmented reality. As you can see in the image on the left, nowadays the mobile phones can analyze the content of the camera and actually put new information on top of the images. That's what is called augmented reality. In that uh, example that is related to diabetes education, the camera analyzed the foot play and then give extra information on top for educational purposes. And in the context of growth hormone therapy, there are also mobile applications, like the one that you had the link in there, that using game techniques, uh, encourage children to learn how to take injection for growth hormone and also uh, do it in a way that is entertaining and promoting uh, good uh, injection techniques. Now let's move to the discussion. Now I would like to address some few questions that will help us with the debate. 
Which technology do you think has the biggest potential to support patients? Also, and very important, do you believe clinicians are, and patients are trained enough to use digital health nowadays? And finally, one multi-choice question I would like to ask you. Will you consider in clinical practice patient-generated data about health and weight, meaning data that comes from the patient using any e-health tool? Thank you. If you have any further questions, you have my contact details in this slide. Thank you very much, uh, Luis, uh, for a very informative presentation. And it now gives me pleasure to introduce uh, Sandro Locke. And Sandro's presentation is entitled Growth Hormone Adherence Management Using Digital Technology. Sandro, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for your kind presentation. These are my disclosures. Uh, I wish to start my talk uh, with a simple question. Is adherence an issue? The answer may sound trivial. But the optimal results of therapy are achieved when medication is taken as prescribed. In the real world, this is a major challenge. So consider that both the WHO and the OECD to international organization estimate that one out of two patients with chronic disease does not use their medication as prescribed. And you can imagine this is a big problem and a major challenge. As a matter of fact, Drug companies have designed a number of tools and different devices to help monitoring adherence. And you can see some examples in these slides, like video directly of cerebral therapy, add-on pants, smart blisters, connected pants, or the modern electronic auto-injectors can that can record the number of injections, the dose, the timing, and so on. But let's uh, go to the topic of my presentation, which is adherence to growth hormone therapy. You all certainly know that the goal of growth hormone treatment includes normalization of linear growth, the achievement of a normal adult stature and the correction of metabolic abnormalities when they're present, especially in those with severe growth hormone deficiency. However, there are a number of factors which may influence responsiveness to growth hormone treatment. And these include baseline HF1 concentration, the dose of growth hormone used, the duration of treatment, the genetics of the individual patient, the diagnosis, age of the start of treatment, bone age, height, the parental height, as well as adherence to treatment. On the other hand, adherence may be adversely affected by a number of factors which can be related to the patient itself, or to the disease, or to the doctor, or to the treatment. Let me just give you some examples. There are patient-related factors, such as the confidence that the patient has seen the treatment and the doctor, or the fact that the treatment regime takes into account patient stage of development. There are disease-related factors, such as the fact that you're dealing with an acute disorder or there is severe affection. 
or the real understanding of the value of treatment and how it may improve the quality of life of the patient. There are doctor-related factors, such as doctor's medical competency or doctor's communication skills in explaining both medical benefits and adverse events. And finally, there are treatment-related factors, such as the frequency of injections, the fact that the regime of treatment is simple or complex, the fact that non painful procedures are involved, and the possibility of using devices that offer easier views. And now I have a question for you. Which factors are associated with, with poor adherence in pediatric patients taking growth hormone? Gender, use of conventional syringe rather than automatic pen injection device, Underlying cause of short stature, initial height standard deviation score, or concern regarding size or growth response. Please pick one. Well, the correct answer is two. The use of conventional syringe rather than automatic pen injection device. A number of studies have shown that using automatic pen injection device improves adherence in a variety of conditions. Now, what do we know about adherence to therapy with growth hormone? Actually, there are a few studies reporting the rate of adherence in long-term growth hormone treatment. Their results are very contrasting and mainly depend on the method used to record adherence. They went from 6 to 81% of poor adherence. So there is no homogeneity between different studies. Virtually all use non-objective methods, mostly questionnaires. So but what happens if a patient is not adherent? Non-adherent patients may not gain the physical and psychological benefits of growth hormone treatment. Although with the limitations that I taught you before, a couple of studies have shown that poor adherence is in fact related to poor growth. You see in this slide that the compliance that the factor associated was associated with adherence during 6-12 month observation period. And you can see that the growth velocity in the patients who missed more than 15 injections was clearly lower than those who missed no injection or less than three injections per month. Again, this study shows that adherence is inversely correlated with high velocity standard deviation score during the first six to eight months of treatments. And you see that the patient with low adherence are the lowest high velocity, while the patient with a high adherence are the highest high velocity. Well, then we come to modern technology, the electronic uh, injectors that, that can record adherence and give us an objective measure of adherence. And I want to talk to you about the result of the ECO study. The ECO study is a very large study involving 24 countries who had the primary objective to assess the level of adherence of subjects receiving growth hormone via electronic device, when with a number of secondary objectives, including the impact of adherence on clinical outcomes for patients receiving somatotropin, the impact of adherence on IGF-1 levels, identifying adherence patient profiling, and to assess and describe the impact of the country-specific patient support program. 
The results of the ECO studies have been recently published. More than a thousand patients, actually almost 1,200 patients were involved in the study. More than 600 were growth hormone naive. 75% have growth hormone deficiency. 17% were small for gestational age. 7% have tunnel syndrome and 1% with other conditions. And you can see in these slides, in both courts, the overall and the naive patients, the mean adherence rate was above 85% after three years, and that started to decline slightly in the following years. But this study helped us to answer a number of other questions. First of all, does adherence have an impact on growth outcomes? And the answer is yes. There was a significant correlation between adherence rate and change in height SDS and height velocity SDS after one year of treatment. And I want to remind you that the growth response in the first year of treatment is the best predictor of the final outcome. But more than that, in a subset of patients from the ECO studies, it was shown that suboptimal adherence negatively affected the growth response in the first two years of growth hormone treatment. So adherence is related to growth. Is adherence related to age or sex? It seems not. It is related to the underlying disease. Again, it's not related to the underlying disease. Is a reader related to the severity of growth hormone deficiency? No. Uh, we have some data on that. You see, we extrapolated patients with severe growth hormone deficiency and with no severe growth hormone deficiency from the ECOS cohort. And we analyzed them separately and compared their adherence throughout the first three years of treatment. And you can see from the slide that the adherence was similar in the two groups. So adherence seems not to be related to the severity of growth hormone deficiency. Is really the is adherence related to socioeconomic status? Somewhat it is. It was found that patients with married or prohibiting parents had higher media adherence rates than those with separated or divorced parents, while there were no differences in adherence according to parents' employment status. Adherence was not related to ethnicity, and there were no regional difference in adherence. You see that the three cohorts from Italy, Spain, and Mexico were separately analyzed. And in each study, the adherence rate was above 80-85% after three years. So pretty much similar to the global study. What about the reasons for missing injections? That's interesting. The great majority missed the injections because they just forgot the injection. The second most common cause was holidays along weekends. Then, forget to take the drug. Other reason were technical problems with the device. Patients who ran out of needles. Medical reasons, tired of injections, 
and the other miscellaneous reasons. But the most common reasons were forgetting to perform the injection and being in a holiday or long weekend. I want to share with you a clinical experience of a patient with growth hormone deficiency who started treatment at about seven years of age. During the first years of treatment, he had a very nice growth response with the usual catch-up growth that you commonly observe in the first few years. But about the age of 13, his growth velocity started decelerating. And we wonder whether there was a problem with adherence. Because we know that sometimes the adolescence period is a critical period. For adherence. We talked with the patient, we talked with the parents, and we decided to start monitoring adherence with an electronic device. And actually, we found that adherence was very poor, and its growth velocity continued decelerating. We then talked again with the patient and with the parents, ask support for the family, from the family, and you see that adherence improved. The patient resumed the normal growth velocity and finally ended up with the other stature, which was within his genetic target. So, what can we do to increase adherence? Well, the first step, of course, is to identify poor adherence. And as I've shown you, electronic devices gives you probably the best tool to objectively monitor adherence in patients using growth hormone. We should talk to the parents and the child and emphasize the value of the regimen and the effect of adherence on growth and growth outcome. We should elicit patients feeling about this or ability to follow the regimen and provide simple, clear instructions and simplify the regimen as much as possible. We need to encourage the use of medication taking system. As I told you before, patients who use modern device are those who have the best adherence. Should always listen to the patient and customize the regimen in accordance with the patient's wishes. And this is particularly important in the adolescent period. Should obtain the help from family members, friends, and community service when needed. Patient support programs are very valuable in this context. We need any time to reinforce the desirable behavior and results where appropriate. In conclusion, digital web-based technology allows close and objective monitoring of adherence in patients taking growth hormone. Using these devices, doctors can thus design timely and appropriate interventions for patients with poor adherence in order to maximize the effect of treatment. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Sandro. So now we've come to the time for discussion and Q&A. 
and we will address the questions that you have sent in, which I'm now uh, studying at the moment. Unfortunately, Professor Leo Dunkel is not able to join us for the live question and answer session. However, we look forward very much to answering your questions, and I'm sure with the panel we can have a, an enlightening discussion. Let me just make one point about uh, Professor Dunkel's presentation. To my knowledge, Finland is the only country where this automated growth monitoring is operating satisfactorily. And there are certain reasons for this. They have a relatively small population, but there's also this tradition of public health and prevention of illness, which is a very strong uh, sentiment in Scandinavian countries. So basically, there needs to be this understanding that current methods of growth monitoring simply don't work. It doesn't work if you just wait for the referral of a short child uh, to a doctor. That, that will happen much too late. So there has to be this understanding that the early diagnosis of specific abnormalities, and these need to be specified, such as celiac disease, Turner syndrome, uh, these conditions benefit, or the children benefit enormously from early diagnosis. There also has to be this investment, and of course this goes along with, with a political view of the importance of, of public health. The investment in the city where Leo Dunkel was describing the research, 260,000 inhabitants, there were 150 primary health nurses employed. Of course, they cover many things related to pediatrics, but again, this investment is very important. And of course, they have to be accurately trained and they have to be able to measure the children very carefully. And this involves enormous training. They have to be able to measure with, a measure, with an error of um, less than one millimeter in terms of height. So I think this is a very interesting model and it would be fascinating to see how transferable uh, this model is to other, other countries. Now let me uh, open the discussion by asking Luis. Luis, if I wanted to establish a, a, a program of automated health uh, monitoring, particularly growth, in my in my region in my department and i came to you as a as a technology consultant um how would you actually how would you go about this what are what are the essential steps that are really necessary in order to make this work thank you martin for your question and um, that's actually something quite important in the sense that there are many different aspects that need to be addressed First of all, you need to speak with the IT department to make sure that you understand the privacy and cybersecurity cyber policies uh, of your hospital or your region. Otherwise, you will never manage to have it interoperable. Second, you need to also find out how you want to see that data into your clinical uh, system, into the computer. Do you want to visualize in a particular way, uh, etc.? And never forget that you will need to train the both the patients that are being collected that you are collecting the data from, and the clinicians on how to use that data as part of the clinical decision making. Okay, so basically, this is something which. This is a program which links primary care, because these are healthy children uh, in school, to hospital care, which is the time where the, the data are viewed by a consultant, by a pediatric endocrinologist, to see which of the children actually need to be seen in, in the hospital. 
So um, I think it's very important. And I think one of the benefits of a system like this is that it brings together primary care and secondary care, and then of course, tertiary care, which is the special, specialist investigation and treatment of, of some, some of these children. So this is obviously very, very important. And again, there has to be the conviction that the early diagnosis of celiac disease or Turner's syndrome is of significant benefit to the patient and family. And that is, that is clearly the case. There's no question if you take uh, celiac disease, which is one of the conditions that was diagnosed early, which Leo Dunkel presented, there is no question that the health of the child treated early for celiac disease is significantly better than uh, the child who is diagnosed much later because growth is, a, is an issue in celiac disease. So um, let me come back to you, Luis. Now, you gave a very elegant presentation on the possible involvement of digital tools in endocrinology. And I can see that in something like diabetes, where there has to really be minute by minute control in order to avoid hypoglycemia, in order to avoid ketoacidosis. And the child receives a message on their phone, they have to, they have to uh, get their blood tested and then perform some action. I can see that the children are, are very, very involved. But with something like growth, which happens on a much slower basis, how do you really think that digital tools can help in the, in the monitoring of growth? Obviously, Sandra has talked about adherence, which we'll come on to in a minute. But in terms of the routine assessment, diagnosis, and monitoring of growth, do you think digital tools have an application? Thank you for your question. And definitely collecting data from the patients is very important. And you can monitor growth. There are some technologies that can do it at home. Of course, the quality of the data will depend a lot, a lot on how the, the parents or the children are doing the, the measurement. But with the proper training, you can manage to get data that is meaningful always never substituting the data that you get from the clinic but there are also many other things related to growth that you can monitor you can monitor physical activity nutrition and also very important all the behavioral and emotional aspects that will have ultimately an impact into adherence so you want to know whether stress is affecting the way that the parents or the kids are approaching the, the treatment and that can be monitored using mobile health solutions. And presumably you need, you need growth charts which are specific for the particular population that you are studying. And um, this is something yes. which, which has been discussed. Are the WH growth charts appropriate because they are designed for a multi-ethnic uh, population? or are national growth, growth charts um, really more valuable in this situation? Do you have a view on that at all? Yeah, that's actually a very important point. We did a systematic review of mobile application for tracking growth, and they're extremely popular. We published, uh, I think, what, uh, early this year. Uh, there are hundreds of apps for tracking growth. One of the challenges that many parents, when they are looking for those tools to uh, do the growth charge of their children. They may be in Portugal and they, without noticing, they may be using the growth charge from USA. So that yeah. can be a very big challenge. So having tools that are tailored to the specific population countries is quite important because otherwise we may give the growing information to the families and that can have an impact in the clinic in terms of expectations, etc. So this really points towards the importance of a partnership between the family and the people with te technical knowledge who are advising the family and the hospital uh, specialists, if you like, 
who will be able to advise in terms of uh, investigations and uh, also also progress uh, in terms of giving encouragement when the child is seen to be growing very well. Let me ask you about uh, patient data, data accumulated outside the hospital. Is there an issue at all in the, in the, the sharing of patient data? Are there ethical issues related to that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good comment. And first of all, it's very important to know that if we want to understand the health of the patient, uh, we need to look into the lifestyle, into the behaviors, how they are doing uh, in the daily life. That has a very high impact in quality of life and also in clinical outcomes. The problem that right now, you clinicians very often don't have that, in, that data because it doesn't happen in the hospital. So that data that is generated in the ecosystem from the patient, whether it's a connected injection device, whether it's like a questionnaire related to the stress level, across the, the week, uh, if we want to improve the decision making of clinicians, we need to find a way to integrate. But that integration has to be meaningful and easy, meaning that it has to be in your electronic health record so that you can get access to that information in the when it's needed. There are legal issues because that data is not generated by the hospital, but generated by the patients that are sharing with the hospital. There are also uh, usability issues because clinicians don't know how they are how to see that data sometimes the visualization may be a problem and of course quality can be also an issue but then we are dealing with much more data that quality sometimes is not as good as the clinical one so how do you factor that into the clinical decision making that's a big challenge and there are quite many people researching into that area I mean, quality of life uh, assessment in children, I think is very difficult for a number of reasons. Firstly, in terms of privacy, I mean, the family may not agree or want healthcare professionals to know about certain aspects of the, of the, of the quality of life. I mean, if the father has an alcohol problem or the mother smokes or whatever it is, or, um, you know, they're, they're separated, I, th I think that's one aspect which makes it very difficult. The other thing is that children are amazingly adaptable. And for many years, it was difficult to demonstrate actually that height was a negative quality of life factor. Um, it, it's now only been more recently uh, demonstrated through highly sophisticated questionnaires that height gain actually does improve health related quality of life. So these are, these are uh, difficult aspects and also time consuming. And because they're time consuming, they're expensive. And these are, these are different factors. Now, there's a very interesting question which has come in and I'm just reading from my screen. The, the concept of having uh, research centers helping and helping to establish digital tools within an academic department. Can you say, can you say something about that? Yeah, that's a very good comment because we know in health technology in general that very often in implementation solutions fail. People may have a mobile app and then they go to the hospital and then what they use it or actually they may have negative outcomes and very often it's because they forgot the human factor. So we need to really understand how you integrate the technology into the highly demanding clinical setting. How can you do that? You can collaborate with research centers that they spe specialize in usability research, that they do uh, workshops where they test different innovations to get the input from all the different stakeholders in in a way that you can minimize the risk of failing in the implementation. And there are many groups that specialize on that. And it's pretty much mandatory to do that type of collaborations before you put technology into the clinical setting. One characteristic is also that it tends to be very multidisciplinary. You need people from design, people from psychology, 
from technology. And of course, the driver has to be also clinicians and patients. But that's really important if you want to have successful stories in the digitalization in the health domain. Thank you very much. So let me now come to Sandro. We, we've heard your very interesting and very convincing presentation about adherence to growth hormone treatment. How difficult is it to persuade, first of all, a pediatric endocrinologist who's maybe been practicing for several years and he has his he or she has their established organization how difficult is it to persuade this person that adherence is a key factor in the success of growth hormone treatment thank you martin thank you so much for your question actually uh since uh, some years ago, people were uh, a bit skeptical about the role of adherence in, in uh, the response to the growth hormone treatment. Actually, we now know that there are about 15 to 20 percent uh, of growth hormone treated children that have a poor adherence to, to the treatment. And uh, the ECOS global study has shown uh, nicely that there is a, a clear correlation between uh, the levels of adherence and the growth response. So this fact needs to be taken into consideration and adherence should be uh, regularly monitored and closely checked. I can uh, just tell you about our experience. We, you know, first of all, we encourage the family to bring their device when they come uh, for the visit. Uh, then, during the visit, one of our nurses or one of our uh, specialist uh, trainees, which are trained to, you know, to, to, to uh, download the data from the device, which is actually very easy, uh, do that while we visit the patient, and then they come back with the uh, record of adherence over the last three months, because we see these patients usually every three months. Now, if adherence is good, we just congratulate with the patient and with their parents, and we encourage them to keep the same level of adherence. If adherence is bad, we, of course, we need to take some action, and the action depends basically from the age of the patient. You know, with the youngest patient, there is little you can do because the dealers depend mainly uh, uh, from the, the, the parents' behavior. So we talk mainly with the, with the parents, or we talk with the, 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 the adolescent when, uh, when uh, this is the case. We, we, we try to, to to motivate and to, to, to of course to keep motivating and uh, trying to let them understand about the, the importance of Adidas um, on the, the outcome on, on their response to growth of treatment. And are are the family and the children usually do they accept when they see the evidence that the adherence is poor, do they accept that uh, you know something needs to be done, that the situation is, uh, is unsatisfactory, or do they tend to deny the, the adherence, uh, the poor adherence? Now, that's a good point, Martin. Actually, when we started monitoring adherence uh, using the, the electronic device, uh, we had a bad experience because uh, many, well, not, not so many, but some parents actually were unhappy uh, by knowing the fact that adherence was being monitored. So we learned a lot uh, from this experience. And we now start by uh, talking with the family and uh, telling them that monitoring adherence is essential for ourselves because monitoring adherence will eventually uh, give us the, the answer or 
uh, an explanation for an eventually an eventual you know poor response and and in that case we know or we suspect evilly that the poor response is due to poor ideas we're not forced to increase the dose or doing other investigation so we uh, take a lot of time to explain to the family all these aspects of treatment and once they accept the fact that adherence is being monitored uh, they you know they do pretty well yeah i think that's i think that's very interesting so there's quite a lot of preparation necessary and uh, do you find that the education of the the child and the parents first of all in the exact diagnosis and then following up from that the reasons why they need treatment the this education that is given before even growth hormone treatment is started is that also relevant to the level of adherence that comes afterwards well martin actually this is the case and this is really the case and there are uh, data produced in, in england and in australia that show that the level of adherence is uh, uh, correlated to the level of understanding yeah. so as much as the family is aware about the situation the severity of the situation and the benefit of treatment the better is the levels of adhering and how how do you actually motivate the children to um you know to have their injections regularly and not to react and uh, you know refuse their injections how, how do you motivate a young child on the importance of having daily injections when they may they may not see any obvious result well martin as i as, as i said before in a young child your targets should be the parents because can you cannot talk with the, the young child it's very hard to motivate a young child yeah but with the older ones we try to talk to them and you know to uh, encourage them to be more adherent you know just showing them for instance that the final outcome is closely related to their adherence to treatment and of course we try to 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 tell them hey guy you see next visit you you will certainly be taller you will gain more centimeter than you did in the past so be more adherent and you'll see the results well, you know, we try to motivate in any possible way. And usually, you know, the adolescent, uh, you know, it is a very tricky situation, but need to be a lot patient, a lot patient. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's very impressive uh, the way you actually address this whole issue of adherence. And as you've said, it does take time and a certain amount of skill uh, on the part of the uh, the doctor and nurse, you know, how to discuss adherence with families. You know, I mean, there has to be a degree of uh, non non judgmental uh, questioning. But I think I think you've made a very important point that the the time that you commit to really opening the topic of adherence with the family is extremely positive because I think this is something that many clinicians say, oh, I, I haven't got time. I have to see 40 patients in, uh, in the morning and I, I haven't got time, uh, you know, and they just pretend that adherence is good when, when actually we know that in many cases it isn't. So, um, do you see any, or, and, and maybe uh, Luis can come in here. This is a, um, an injection device which records adherence uh, accurately. Do you see how a device can be 
uh, developed and made more sophisticated sophisticated to actually improve this whole area of adherence to treatment. Uh, Luis, what, what, so, what, is, what is on the horizon? So that's a very good question. There are, there are many devices for therapy that they start to be connected, although in growth hormone there are not so many. One thing that is very important is that having that information helps a lot the clinicians to understand whether there is a problem with adherence. Before, you didn't even have that information. There are some challenges still ahead. You may have the data from adherence, but you don't know the reason. So to understand the reason, you need to get more data, for example, to know if there are stresses playing a role, whether they are forgetting, uh, whether to, uh, to try to understand all the other behavioral elements that may be affecting. One uh, issue with data adherence data that you are collecting every day, sometimes several times, is that you are overwhelmed with data. So if you have too much information, how do you make it that meaningful? And one of the potential solutions is the use of artificial intelligence. You can use artificial intelligence to try to identify children that may have future adherence problems so that you can actually try to predict which, which patients or which cohort they need more assistance and then you can provide more tailored support to those group at high risk of poor adherence and you can start playing with different strategies. Do you mean you, you, you establish a profile of a child who is likely possibly to have problems with adherence? Is, is that the exactly. way artificial intelligence can, can, can help? Like in precision medicine, it's using a lot in genetics, but depending on the genetics, you may have different type of treatments. You can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to find those groups, those profiles that they may require more support in the future, so that you're addressing a hidden problem before they are too serious. And because you are going to be able to analyze a lot of data points, there are many things that those artificial intelligence algorithms may be able to, to learn. So can artificial intelligence give you information about home circumstances, socioeconomic uh, indices, and so forth? Eventually, if you had that data, you may be able to identify particular patterns of children that they are at higher risk of having a hearing problem. Yes. And it may not only be socioeconomic, it may be the weather. Maybe with the sunny weather, people go more outside, and then that's why they have more adherence problem during the summer. So right. There are many things that you can start learning by analyzing the data. Of course, there are going to be hypotheses that you need to put into the clinical context. But machines can be very good to help analyze very large quantity of data. And that actually can happen very easily also in adherence once that we have all the data of what is happening. And in your experience, is it valuable, for example, to have a, a specialist nurse who is really taking on the commitment of uh, the use of digital tools? Um, because I think that it, it's, it's very much a human partnership with uh, digital technology, which is going to enable uh, these innovations to work. Yes, and it's very important the role of the nurses because they tend to spend more time with the patients, they tend to provide more educational support, and also uh, they can have a very important role on collecting data uh, that later on gets integrated into the electronic health record. And at the end of the day, we need to think that technology is not, it's just a tool. And it's a tool that helps different humans, whether they are nurses, doctors, a family doctor, a parent, to work together. So we have to think more from a service and a collaboration point of view if we really want to extract to extract the maximum value of those technologies. I mean, yeah, I mean, there will be an argument that any new technology costs money. So basically, you have to make the case that if it works effectively, uh, it, it's going to save money in, in some way, and I, I can I can see that uh, 
you know, new budgets need to be identified to pay for new t digital tools. Um, and th this, this must be one of the, the most difficult aspects, really, of persuading a health authority or an academic institution or even a primary care to invest so much into a tool that uh, eventually will save them money, but will cost a certain amount in the short term. Yeah, that, that's a very good comment and in any technology and any innovation you put into the health domain, you always have a cost, but you have to think more of a cost opportunity balance because you are investing on something that can improve the quality of care, can make more efficient the time of nurses and doctors if you design it properly and eventually can not only save money, but also uh, make more efficient the work of clinicians. And that's one of the key factors for having uh, adoption. We need to think how we can uh, make the work easier for the clinicians in the clinical practice and of higher quality. Because at the end of the day, money is an issue, but the time of clinicians is even more. And having proper integration and facilitating the work of the clinicians will help a lot. And that can be as simple as letting the patients to collect some data, for example, quality of life, that you don't need to run those questionnaires in the clinic, taking time from the clinicians. And there are many different ways that you can try to maximize the value that you are offering to the clinicians. And of course, you also may need randomized control trials if you are looking into clinical outcomes. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the sort of conflicts is basically you, you give a family a questionnaire to fill out while they're waiting to see the doctor and to tick boxes. You know, I've had no uh, respiratory symptoms, no gastrointestinal symptoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They just tick the box. But that misses out completely on the clinical skill of answering a direct question so that you elicit a information which is actually relevant to the diagnosis and um, I think this is this is a problem that is gonna is difficult to get over really the the actual clinical skill of being able to elicit a response or an answer from the child or the family which is relevant to their diagnosis rather than simply ticking a box which uh, which should give you the same information but in fact realistically it doesn't yeah the, there is one project in oslo that is called season where they created those questionnaire for children uh, hospitalized but they did it in a way to complement the clinical encounter later on between the nurses and the children and they found out that by integrating both the clinical encounter with the mobile application for collecting the patient reported outcomes before they had more meaningful conversations the patients that were reporting more symptoms their fears etc but it was designed in a way to complement not to be a substitute if you try to substitute yeah. something that has been done in the clinic for decades for centuries most likely you are going to fail because you will be missing many things as you mentioned but we can try to think how to complement it. That will be the, the key aspect that you need to consider always. It's a question of uh, being able in a, a mobile device to ask a direct question, you know, which will give you a meaningful answer rather than simply an indirect question such as, you know, uh, I've, had, I've, I've had no gastrointestinal symptoms, no headaches or anything, they just tick all the boxes and actually you come out and you look and you, you, you've got no information at all. So, um, yeah, I think that's very interesting what you said about questionnaires which, which complement and add additional information. But what about the training, the training of healthcare professionals and nurses important i mean the nurse really has to have be able to address the family whether it's adherence or whether it's uh, some sort of symptoms or related to diabetes the nurse has to have the confidence 
and the experience to be able to to do this as a, as a professional. So there is obviously training involved in in getting the healthcare professionals up to the level that they so they are convincing. Because if they're if they're not convincing, then the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, so this is very important uh, question and aspect that very often tends to be forgotten. And many clinicians they have faced that people go with technology, they are supposed to use it and they don't know what to do with it. Uh, and they are, we are forgetting the training. And training is very important because it's about getting the confidence on using the tool. It's about getting the skill set to use it right. And at the end of the day, those elements are important to have quality of care and productivity. Otherwise, you may have technology and you may actually detriment on quality and even safety. Uh, so the training should be a crucial part. And it's not something that uh, will be done once and then you forget it because there are new technologies and new challenges coming all the time. For example, how much a clinician should use artificial intelligence? Should they trust the algorithm? Can they analyze whether they should trust that suggestion from the machine? So how do they assess that? So that's a, a decision that is going to come more often as these systems are becoming smarter. But we are not training well enough the clinicians to make that assessment of what to trust or not. And yeah. that's something very important in the future, especially if we are considering the safety of the patient. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I think we're coming now to the time when we will we will uh, wrap up this question and answer session. I would like to thank Leo Dunkel, uh, Luis and Sandro for their excellent presentations and also for this uh, very nice interactive session. And to you, the audience, for sending in your questions. So we're now going to return to the questions which we asked at the beginning of the webinar, you may, may remember, and we're going to provide the answers. So post-assessment questions, which of the following is false, related to automated growth monitoring? Second question, I have confidence in the use of digital technology to improve management of growth disorders, as well as patient self-management. And thirdly, which of the following factors is likely to decrease adherence to growth hormone therapy? So we now come to the end of the webinar. I would like to thank you very much for joining us. We hope very much that uh, this has been a positive learning experience for you. And uh, again, thank you and goodbye.